All right, let's go ahead and start. So I wanted to quickly answer two questions that people asked me at the end of, after the lecture uh, uh, yesterday. One of them was in the context of these dark force models. I talked about dark forces in the mass range of a GeV. And people asked whether there was any particular motivation for that. And a priori, theoretically, there is no specific motivation why it should be around a GeV. In a specific model, it might end up being around that scale. But in general, they can be anywhere. Okay? Now, for specific anomalies, people wanted them to be light. But, uh, but in general, they can be anything. The second one is when I drew this plot, I was assuming that this was something that had been seen before. Um, and, um, and, and I actually can't tell you how happy it makes me that it, it hadn't been seen before, <laughs> uh, because I think that these plots are often oversimplifications of the parameter space. So the fact that, that, that they're being used adequately, insufficiently, that, that their common knowledge is, is actually uh, quite heartening. Um, uh, but so just, just for clarity, um, in the minimal supersymmetric standard model, people often will assume that all of the scalars, squarks, leptons, and Higgses, all start with the exact same scalar mass. And they also assume that all the gauginos, uh, gluino, bino, mino, start with the exact same gauginos mass at the gut scale, and then they RG evolve it down. And so these parameters, m1 half and m0, are those, uh, those parameters. This is the universal gauginos mass, and this is the universal scalar mass, just so that you know. We will not be talking about that. So, a lot to cover today, unsurprisingly. Um, so what I'd like to finish today doing is I'd like to talk about some thermal, non-thermal variants uh, before moving on to the axion and concluding by discussing a bit about uh, dark matter anomalies that are currently going on. So the first non-thermal variant Uh, I want to discuss is asymmetric dark matter. There's a nice review by Zurich where you can get a much, much uh, fuller picture of what's going on in these models or in this framework. So as we discussed on the first day, um, there are many, many different variants of asymmetric dark matter. Um, and, uh, and so it's not totally settled what you mean when you start talking about it. So let me talk about three different examples of them so that you can put them in context when you see them. Uh, the first one is the idea of what I'll refer to as a shared asymmetry. And so this is um, uh, an idea where you don't necessarily assume that you are um, uh, explaining the origin of the asymmetry in the model. You're just assuming that there is some asymmetry, some number of particle not equal to the number of antiparticle in the theory. And then this then gets shared between baryons, leptons, and dark matter. So an example of this could be something like you do leptogenesis, you create a lepton asymmetry in the early universe, and then you use sphalerons to transfer that to baryons. But you could also imagine that Dark matter is a chiral fermion uh, transforming under SU2. And so sphalerons would also transfer the, uh, uh, the number to uh, dark matter as well. But the idea of shared asymmetry is just that there could be processes at the low energy that will mix up the asymmetry between baryons, leptons, and dark matter. And you're not necessarily trying to um, explain it. Or you might explain it in a sort of a traditional baryogenesis fashion, like leptogenesis or aflac 9 baryogenesis, and then you only later transfer it to the dark matter. So dark matter is sort of a, a spectator of the asymmetry. It's not an active participant of the asymmetry. The next idea is um, something which is generally referred to as cogenesis. And cogenesis is the idea that you have some mechanism that is explaining the dark matter asymmetry and the baryon asymmetry simultaneously. Um, but it is generating both asymmetries together. So you have a process that generates B, but also generates D. 
So a, a very, very simple example of this would be to take the sort of canonical um, leptogenesis framework and just add dark matter to it. That's right. So B is baryon number, L is lepton number, and D is dark matter number. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Between this and this. So this, I would be imagining something where I go ahead and I say, do affleck baryogenesis. I produce a baryon asymmetry, and then at low energy, I have some sort of mechanism. Maybe it's some broader class of sphalerons. Maybe it's some higher dimension operators that basically allow me to transfer that number into the dark sector. Okay. Whereas cogenesis would be something where I'm not just doing that, I'm actually imagining that I have something which is simultaneously producing them. So, uh, what is the reason to warrant us in the dark sector? Well, so the reason that you, there, there's two reasons why you might want an asymmetry in the dark matter. The first reason is because uh, there appears to be a baryon asymmetry. And so possibly, if that baryon asymmetry is somehow connected to a dark asymmetry, you might understand why the omega dark matter and omega baryon are, are similar. The second one you might want to consider is just more phenomenological, where there are certain signals that will appear in the context of asymmetric dark matter that won't appear necessarily in the context of, of symmetric dark matter. Well, um, in the same spirit of, of, um, of uh, the uh, trying to save models, right, where you add sometimes parameters. Sometimes you can imagine a situation where a model might be ruled out because it would give you too large of an indirect detection signal. But if dark matter is entirely, uh, if, if dark matter has a, an asymmetry, then there's no anti-dark matter for it to annihilate with. And you can sort of turn those off. So uh, it, conversely, sometimes uh, asymmetric dark matter models can be more dangerous because for instance, if you capture asymmetric dark matter into um, astrophysical objects, they will accumulate, they will not annihilate, and they might start acting as a transport mechanism for, for energy. So, so it's not like it's necessarily 100% safer. It can be uh, more dangerous sometimes, but it it's just has different phenomenology. Which is then the second motivation, which is just it's perfectly reasonable to consider these types of models, right? And you want to understand how they're different. Not relying on necessarily all the couplings being dictated by a thermal abundance, but allowing those couplings to be very, very different, right? These things could be much, have much stronger interactions uh, possibly than, uh, than uh, thermal relics. But so an example of cogenesis is something like uh, uh, a variant of leptogenesis. So for those of you who have not done leptogenesis, the idea is that you start with some heavy right-handed neutrino. It has a Yukawa matrix to the standard neutrinos and the Higgs boson, and through loops, you have CP violation in your decays. So you're used to the idea that you have an asymmetry where the usually lightest right-hand neutrino decays preferentially into leptons. That's not an F, that's a gamma. Um, and this initial epsilon generates a lepton asymmetry, which then through sphalerons gets transferred to a baryon asymmetry. And so you can imagine adding something like this to it, where you then get a, a, a similar term for uh, dark matter. Right? It's, it's really just taking the mechanism and reapplying it. Now, that's not map, it's gamma. Um, now, if you generate these asymmetries, uh, the asymmetry in the lepton sector is determined by uh, loops uh, coming from this type of interaction. The asymmetry in the dark sector will be involving loops coming from this type of interaction. So in principle, these numbers can be very, very, very different. So I could have a dark matter asymmetry. I mean, it's still a small number because it's being generated through loops. But in principle, um, and washout will be different. But in principle, these are just free numbers. I can have a certain dark matter number, and I can have a certain um, uh, baryon number at the end of the day. But the same mechanism is, is generating them. So phi is some new field and chi is the dark matter? That's right, yeah. So phi would be some sort of Higgs, uh, something that you would want to be ultimately unstable. Chi is dark matter, yeah, and L is left on, yeah. Um, 
And then the last thing that I want to talk about uh, in this context is something that is called dark baryogenesis or darkogenesis. Um, uh, very similar ideas have been introduced and called hylogenesis and exogenesis. Um, and this I would take as an opportunity to, you want this to go up? Um, this I would take as an opportunity to uh, it, take a sort of like a life lesson for you, okay? Three people or three groups come out with similar ideas approximately simultaneously. One group calls it this. The other two groups call it this. If you are encountering this paper or this idea, if I come to you and I say, I'm going to talk to you about darkogenesis or dark baryogenesis, even if you don't know the actual model, you probably are like, I kind of guess what you're talking about, right? Before I even start writing down a model, uh, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Whereas if I say to you, and I, I like these people quite a bit, they're very nice people, and they're very good scientists, but if I say to you, I'm going to tell you about hylogenesis today, you're going to say, are you talking about, right? <laughs> so just, you know, <laughs> being clever with names is sometimes a good thing, but sometimes it's good to be clear with your names. Um, because nowadays, people don't really use these. They'll use talk about that. At any rate, the idea of this kind of a scenario is that you employ the Sakharov conditions in the dark sector. So you violate C, Cp. You have some out of equilibrium condition. Um, and you violate dark matter number. Um, and then you introduce some operators that allow you to transfer the dark matter asymmetry into the baryon asymmetry. And in doing so, you then explain the baryon number from dark matter number. And the thing that's good about this is just, well, dark matter is very, very unconstrained, so you have a lot of freedom to do it. Whereas in, say, even leptogenesis, there are constraints on what you know about the neutrino mass matrix. Yes? Oh, uh, it's some, some Greek something. <laughs> you know, and see, that just proves my point. Yes? That's right. That's right. Uh, do you, uh, so you're not using, uh, well, you often will use weak scalarons because maybe the way you're going to transfer, you might transfer your asymmetry from the dark sector to baryons via leptons, right? So you could imagine that the process goes. So, so basically, you have three different scenarios, and they're all the logical possibilities. One is you produce the baryons, you produce a baryon number, and then you transfer that over to the dark matter somehow. One is you have some mechanism that produces them simultaneously. And then the third option is you produce the dark matter number and you transfer that over to baryons. The way you can transfer it over to baryons could be that you produce a dark matter number, you have some operator that then transfers it to leptons, and then through sphalerons, you then transfer that to baryons, for instance. You mean, you mean what is actually generating the asymmetry in the dark sector? Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, you can employ any of the things that you're used to employing, um, but you just do them in the dark sector. So you can have your, your out of equilibrium phase transition could be because you actually have a phase transition in some scalar field that has a first order phase transition. You can have unstable particles akin to uh, leptogenesis. I mean, if you want, right, I could erase the right-handed lepton from the cogenesis scenario, just produce a dark matter asymmetry, and then transfer it later on through higher dimension operators. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I totally follow what what, what you're asking. So, uh, if you uh, if you did it through uh, 
Oh, well, so 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 you're saying imagine that that I I, I engineer the actual of uh, the, the standard model electroweak phase transition to be first order. And uh, yeah, yeah. So you can do that, and as long as that first order phase transition is then related to the dark matter uh, asymmetry as well. Although you'll have to be a little careful because the usual stories of how you get uh, um, usual stories about how you get electroweak baryogenesis usually involve right having collisions at the bubble wall, having an asymmetry inside and outside, and then transitioning that with Svalaron. So. I would at least want to be careful that, because the baryon asymmetry that you'll generate at the same time there just from standard model uh, a CP violation is very small. Yeah, I, I was just wondering, like, how would you get dark matter? Oh, so what you would probably do, just to construct a very, very, very uh, kludgy model, is let me construct a different scalar sector, okay? Not the electric symmetry breaking, but something which is going to have a mass that's sort of, you know, TeV-ish, just to, to be easy. And then I'll imagine that its potential is such that it undergoes a first order phase transition, produces a baryon asymmetry, and then I have operators that then transfer that over to the standard model sector. Yeah. Yeah. Although you can, there are scenarios where you can imagine um, uh, where the dark matter is charged under SU2 cross U1 and then actually is participating in. Uh, Standard model scale runs. Yeah. So supposing we have a mechanism that gives the right relic abundances, what are the different ways in which we can constrain these? That's very, very, I mean, it's very, very model uh, dependent. Um, yeah, it's very, very model dependent. Um, uh, one way, and I'll just, and this is the, the probably the, the last qualitative point that you want to make about this, is that in, in standard baryogenesis stories, the way it works is that you need to satisfy the Sakharov conditions, but there's one more condition, right, that you actually satisfy, which is that you allow yourself to annihilate away B and B bar. Now that's given to us already in the standard model because we have the strong interactions, so you can deplete yourself well down below the baryon asymmetry of the universe. That's not a given in the dark matter. Uh, so you usually have to introduce some interaction for the dark matter that allows it to annihilate itself away down to this uh, uh, leftover asymmetry. And so sometimes, for instance, that can be a dark photon, and then that might give you some, some interactions. This is just, these are really, I have, a, I have, I have two free parameters, yeah. There, there, there are, depending on, um, on what you assume about the uh, operators that allow transitions between the dark sector and the standard model sector. But assuming that this hap you, if, if assuming this happens at a high temperature where you equilibrate, uh, then it's just uh, an equilibrium question, right? So you have some operator that has some baryon charge, and then you have an operator, and that operator has a dark charge. And then that allows these states to then equilibrate. And then you do end up with some relationships, which I can write down for you, but they're not super instructive. Uh, it's model dependent based on the charges of the operators that are connecting the asymmetries. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, you're talking about something which is uh, um, spontaneous baryogenesis type ideas where you have some time, you have some, some time, uh, some rolling field that could be, if not, it could be something else, uh, which uh, gives you the CP violation. So yeah, so basically anything that you've thought of doing for baryons, you can now do in the dark sector, and then you add some means of transitioning that over to the standard model. So, um, so moving on from asymmetric dark matter, so other things which are similar to but not exactly thermal variants, um, it's worth thinking about the processes when we talk about thermal equilibrium because we were assuming when I talked about thermal relics that the dark matter was actually in equilibrium and that's not necessarily true that it ever has to reach equilibrium. So for instance, you can think about a situation where you have a cross-section 
which goes like 1 over some scale squared, in which case, if you're talking about, so you imagine that you have your thermal bath, and it's going to start producing dark matter, then just dimensionally, you know that n sigma v is going to be something like um, t cubed over lambda squared. And so then you can ask a question, which is, in one Hubble time, how much stuff am I going to produce? And so you can compare these rates, n sigma v divided by uh, Hubble, And assuming this is radiation dominated, then you just find that this ratio scales like t. Right? So I'm not saying anything remarkable. I'm saying that if I have a rate which has a high enough dependence on t, and I have the Hubble which has a dependence on t, then in principle, most of my production could be early on. Right? And so that's what can happen in various models. You can have a situation where you have uh, your thermal bath, which is producing uh, dark matter, but it never quite reaches equilibrium. And an example of this, the canonical example of this, would be something like the Axino, which has its production through a higher dimension operator, and that operator suppressed by a very, very high scale. In which case, the relic abundance is, in general, set by T reheat. The amount of dark matter that you have is dictated by the highest temperature that the universe has ever been in when it was in a thermal state. And so that is an example of a non-equilibrium model, which is dominated entirely by the UV. So axinos can go from a wide range of masses, from sort of KeV up to weak scale. Um, yeah. So slightly lighter than in general, they're slightly wider than WIMP, although people have thought about scenarios where they're, they're, they're WIMP scale. But then what, what do you mean from the thermal equilibrium? It's just not the density yet. Or? Oh, it's just because its interactions are so suppressed. It's, it's suppressed by the axion decay constant, usually. Um, and that's enough to, to keep it from coming into equilibrium. If, I mean, if the reheat temperature is high enough, it will come into thermal equilibrium, because eventually uh, this will actually be greater than 1. But if it's less than 1, then you only produce a little bit of it, and then that's your dark matter yield. Yeah? Um, so I don't know if you exactly follow what you mean. What I'm imagining is, so you have inflation, you have some oscillating scalar field, it decays, reheats, then that plasma instantly is starting to produce various things. Well, instantly meaning that uh, on time scales where you're dominated by the earliest production. So when I say instantly, I really mean in the first Hubble time, you'll basically produce all of your dark matter. So as long as you're at some temperature, the plasma will start colliding and producing dark matter, produce dark matter, and it'll keep doing that until it cools off. And when it cools off, it will still be colliding and producing dark matter, but the rate is lower. And so most of the dark matter that you produced was produced at the very outset. You're talking about the you're talking about the 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 radiation from the fact that you're in desitter space. Oh, uh, well, that that's I, I think that we're talking about the same thing. So the infliton will decay, produce radiation, and that radiation will then. But that is T reheat, right? That is what we're talking about. Yeah, well, let's discuss later. So I I haven't much understand. Oh, the axion, which we'll talk about in a moment, is uh, is a totally different beast. Yes. Well, freeze out is usually what you mean when you say that. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's the the production process and there's the reverse process. They never reach equilibrium. So you basically make the stuff, and it never has a chance to annihilate with itself. Uh, at early times, this will be it, have the same. You have to be very, very little careful. But yeah, it'll have the same temperature. It'll be produced at this temperature T. Um, 
it probably would have some non-thermal properties to it because its production cross-section is temp temperature dependent. So when you produce this stuff, you're going to be getting preferentially the higher, you're going to see the, the, the higher velocity particles producing it. Um, but in terms of what is its characteristic temperature going to be, it's, or the characteristic kinetic energy will still be T, even though it probably won't actually have a, a thermal spectrum. OK. So let me, for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to, this is probably a decent segue then, I'm going to go on to the axion. Now, um, the axion is an extremely interesting model. And so you wonder when you have a lecture like this or you go to a conference about dark matter and you see the sort of ratio of talks uh, about thermal dark matter to uh, talks about axion dark matter. And it's very easy to think like, well, does this mean that there's some sort of judgment that one scenario is better than another one? And again, with the caveat that this is what I said at the beginning, this is one person's opinion, I don't think there's any real reason to say that the axion is a better or worse model than thermal or thermal variants like these. Um, it's just that with thermal dark matter and things like that, there are all sorts of additional things you can do. Right? There are a lot of different tests you can talk about, direct, indirect, collider. You can put them into a weak scale model. You can study how they appear there. There's a lot of things you can do. And so you see a lot more papers, a lot more talks. The axion is a uh, more, even though there are different models for axions, what actually shows up at the low energy is usually has less variation. And so there's just less research output on it. But I don't think that's a, a statement about whether it's a good model or not. I just want to be very, very clear. I think the axion is an extremely good and interesting model. So uh, if you've not seen it before uh, in studying, uh, did Scott do inflation yet? No? OK. So in an expanding universe, the Klein-Gordon equation for a scalar field is this. It just looks like the usual Klein-Gordon equation, but it has this. Oops has this friction term in it. And you can solve this. Uh, to be lazy, I'll solve it under the assumption that h is a constant. You can solve this by taking phi and just imagining that this is some uh, oscillating scalar field, although this I'm using a real uh, uh, frequency here. And then it's a very, very simple problem. You solve a quadratic equation, and you get a frequency of this. Yeah, is there anything? Oh, no, 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 I'm not talking about inflation. I'm just saying that if you talk about inflation, then you need to talk about a scalar field, namely the inflaton. And so you write down the same equation when you talk about it. So that's why I was asking if Scott had already done this, because then he would have solved the same equation. What I'm talking about is a scalar field in a later universe uh, during radiation domination. The Klein-Gordon equation is the same. It's the same. This is just the Klein-Gordon equation in an expanding universe. But to simplify my life, I'm going to solve this by assuming that h is a constant. Um, but you can do the same thing more uh, properly by assuming that it has whatever time dependence you want. So if you solve this under that assumption, the first thing you could do is to take the limit where the mass of the scalar field is much, much less than the Hubble scale, in which case you have solutions which are like 3h and minus 2m squared over h, 3h. And so if h is constant, then your scale factor is that of the sitter space. It's e to the ht. And so if I ask, how does this field evolve? Well. If I think about how uh, it evolves, this, so I have two different modes. I can think about them one at a time. The first mode means that this field phi is going to redshift like phi times e to the minus 3ht, which is phi naught a to the minus 3, which means that the energy is going to redshift like um, a to the minus 6. Okay? So this is an energy density that's going to redshift away very, very, very quickly. The other mode 
has a Just so you know, Tom, you can actually cut yourself with that stuff. <laughs> I'm going to bleed all over the chalkboard now. Um, um, so if you think about the second mode, then um, the second mode, you just do the exact same thing. And now the energy density is going like phi naught squared uh, a to the minus. We get make sure I get my powers correct. Four m squared over three h squared. So this is now, since we have the limit where m is much, much less than h, we have uh, a situation where this energy density is approximately constant. Okay. And this is just the usual story of slowly rolling scalar fields in the early universe. You put them there. Part of it decays away right away. Part of it just sticks around for a very, very, very long time. The next thing then you can consider is the situation where m is much, much larger than the Hubble size. And then you have your solutions, which are 3h over 2 plus or minus im. And so now you have a scalar field, which is oscillating. And when you look at the energy density, Uh, this is then proportional to phi naught squared times m squared times a to the minus 3. And this is the point that I wanted to reach. The point is, is if you take a scalar field with some mass, as long as that mass is larger than the Hubble constant, and you put it in an expanding universe, and you look at how that energy density dilutes, you find that the total energy density of that scalar field, kinetic plus potential, is going to redshift away like a to the minus 3, but that's precisely how dark matter redshifts away, right? Dark matter redshifts away like a to the minus 3. And this stuff actually then acts like dark matter. So loosely speaking, this is what the axion is. The axion is a scalar field that is sitting somewhere in the early universe. At some point, a scalar potential turns on for it. It begins oscillating. And once it begins oscillating, its energy density begins decaying away like a to the minus 3, as dark matter does. Okay. So if you want to ask questions about the axion, then uh, the question is, where does its potential come from, and what is its mass? And the answer is that the potential for a QCD axion comes from um, instanton effects. So let's remind ourselves, because we talked about this now just on the first day, of what the axion is. So the axion is, remember, that in the standard model Lagrangian, you have the possibility of adding a, um, a CP violating term to QCD, which is theta g mu nu g mu nu. Right? And there's, there's no symmetry that forbids this except for CP. And so you might even say, well, look, I'm going to imagine that, because I know I have CP violation in my CK matrix, which comes about because I have some overall phase in my quark mass matrix. And so you might say, well, I'm going to imagine that I have CP is a good symmetry. I set this to 0. And then I'm going to spontaneously generate the theta in the quark mass matrix. And now I've solved my problem. I don't have to worry about theta QCD because it was 0 at the outset. But for those of you who've looked at this before, you know that that's not actually uh, a good solution because the the uh, phase of the quark mass matrix actually can be the, there is a phase in the quark mass matrix that can be rotated into this term. So the actual physical term is not theta, but theta bar, which is theta plus the argument of the determinant of your quark mass matrix. Okay. So that's why you can't just say CP and solve all of your problems. However, this also points you to the solution of the problem at the same time, which is, 
if we, we maybe don't know how to turn this itself into a, a dynamical field, but we are very, very familiar with how to turn mass matrices into dynamical fields. Right? So the Higgs boson already turns the quark mass matrices into dynamical fields. And so if you produce your mass matrices where the phase corresponds to a massless field, then that massless field can be the axion. So all of the axion models basically come from this idea that you're going to write down some colored particles. Maybe they're the standard model particles. Maybe they're some new particles. And you make sure that the overall phase, this phase, of their mass matrix corresponds to a massless degree of freedom. Okay. If that's true, then QCD effects generate for you a potential Which? Oh, well, well, right now I'm talking about the QCD axiom. Okay. Yeah, I'm talking about the QCD axiom. So you generate a potential. Uh, that looks like this. So you start at very, very high uh, energies. The, the axion is massless because strong, uh, the strong interactions are not strong. They're weak and perturbative at, at a uh, high scale. So that means that the instanton effects are irrelevant. So the potential for the axion is, is you imagine that you had some, uh, you, you want this field to be massless. So you imagine that it's some sort of Goldstone boson. So there's some spontaneously broken U1 symmetry. Right? And so this field corresponds to some mode moving along the valley of this spontaneously broken U1 symmetry. Then when the instanton effects turn on, this potential gets tilted. And this minimum here is where theta bar is equal to 0, where the axion cancels off whatever tree level theta there was. And so the mass of the axion around this minimum is 0 0.6 eV, sorry, milli eV times 10 to the 10 GeV over hefe. Um, well, in principle, you should be able to calculate whatever field configurations you want, but they'll go like e to the minus 8 pi over g squared, right? So there, it's not it's, it's not going to do anything. And it's only when you go down and G becomes order one that then this potential turns on. Oh, so 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 it's these are just QCD instantons. So the calculation uh, is was done originally by Gross. So it's just that there are these uh, there are the effects because you're actually talking to color fields. So there's. That it, it looks like w the way it comes down to you is that you think that you have a, a, a good symmetry, but it's actually violated by uh, the fact that this, this symmetry is anomalous. And so uh, when QCD gets strong, that anomaly then gives you a potential. Yes. So there are two basic models that people like to talk about, although these are not the only models that you can write down, but just so that we're on the same page, there's the K KSVZ and DFSZ. The S and the Z are different. So that's um, Kim, Schiffman, Beinstein, and uh, Zakharov, and Dein, Bischler, uh, Srednitsky, and uh, Zhidnitsky. And the idea for KSVZ is that you just start with a totally new sector. So you start with the field phi. You start with Q left and Q right. These are massless quarks. You then have some V of phi. 
that spontaneously breaks this U1 symmetry. And, um, and then so it's essentially the phase of these guys which is acting as your axion. In DFSZ, you're taking the standard model fields and you're introducing a new Higgs doublet. So you have, um, you have the standard model Higgs plus another Higgs and you write down an interaction between them like this, where if I didn't have uh, this interaction, I would actually have two U1 symmetries, because I can rotate this Higgs along with the quark, say, and I can rotate this one freely. And once I allow these things to talk to each other through this VEV, once this guy gets a VEV, I've now broken that down to um, a single U1. So you're spontaneously breaking that pair of U1s down to a single U1. And this, because this now talks to the standard model Higgses, um, you have couplings to standard model fermions directly. So it's not just uh, to QCD. So before we talk about detecting these things, let's talk about the production of axions. So how do you get dark matter from axions? Well, the standard way of getting dark matter for axions comes from something that's called the misalignment mechanism. And the misalignment mechanism basically says, look, a priori, and we'll talk about this specific cosmology in a second, a priori I could have started with my axion anywhere here, right? So as long as I don't start at zero, then when the axion is formed it has a certain amount of energy in it. And so that's going to be some dark matter. So if I start very, very close to the minimum, then the axion has very, very little energy and there's not that much dark matter. And if I start far away from the uh, minimum, then I have a lot of energy in my dark matter. And so that's the misalignment mechanism, it's just stating where you start. But now you can ask the question, cosmologically, where do you start? And so this symmetry, which is referred to as a Peche-Quinn symmetry, Peche-Quinn, um, is you can imagine that this symmetry is broken in two different periods. You can imagine that it's broken before inflation, or you can imagine it's broken after inflation. So let's start with the Second case, if Peche Quinn symmetry is broken after inflation, then in every single Hubble patch of the universe that we is our currently observable universe, the axion field will roll off into different directions. There's nothing that's going to tell you where it's going to roll off. So at high high temperatures, you're sitting here, right? The the, the axion potential is 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 you, you go through inflation, uh, you reheat, it's a thermal universe, the axion is confined to the origin, then eventually you go through a phase transition where the peche quinn symmetry breaks, it rolls off, and so in one part of the universe it rolls off here, one part of the universe it rolls off here, and another part of the universe it rolls off here. So if you look at the universe on average, the value, the initial value of the peche quinn field, of, this, of the axion field, is order one. You have to be a little bit careful because when you get very far away from the origin, it's not really acting like a just ordinary massive field. It's got additional interactions. But to a very, very good approximation, you can just say that you get some order one value for the axion field. And so when this potential turns on, later on, when you get down to the QCD phase transition, this potential turns on. In this part of the universe, you have a lot of dark matter. In this part of the universe, you have a little dark matter. But those regions of the universe are relatively small. So on average, the dark matter is sort of that that you would have gotten if it had started at a generic point on the potential. Okay? So this component of the production of axion dark matter is calculable okay? if the peche quinn symmetry is happening after inflation because it's just starting with an order one uh, value. However, if the peche quinn symmetry is broken after inflation, um, you actually have to I now need these notes. 
If the phase shift plane symmetry is broken after inflation, so the so the story that the way that this is essentially works is, is the following. At very, very high temperatures, so you go through inflation and then you reheat. And you reheat and your potential looks like this, right? Because you're at high temperature, the interactions then keep you uh, localized to the origin. At some point in the history of the universe, you generate this minimum through first or second order phase transition, doesn't really matter. And so you roll off, right? And in one Hubble patch, you roll off here. In one Hubble patch, you roll off here. And one. So you're, you're with me that the average value of the axion field throughout the universe in its initial condition is basically order one, right? The phase is essentially order one, the initial oh, phase. So then when I turn on this potential, then I just need to do some average over what the initial conditions are to know what the average value of dark matter is in the universe. Now, that's not the only mechanism for producing axions, though, uh, if you have the peche quinn phase transition after uh, inflation. This is a U1. You're breaking a global U1. That means that you're going to be able to produce strings. These are strings from a global U1, so they're going to have attractive interactions. And when you go through the QCD phase transition, you produce domain walls that connect them. And so those objects actually have been argued to be the dominant source of axion dark matter when those things um, radiate away their energy. So there's a paper by these authors. where they go through this calculation and argument, and they show that actually, in general, most of the axion production is coming from these sorts of topological structures and not through the misalignment mechanism. Now, that is under the assumption that the peche quinn phase transition happens after inflation. Yeah. There is a lot of controversy based on this, but I think the controversy is mostly about exactly how, whether it's an order one correction or an order 100 correction. But I think most people agree that it is, in general, comparable. But I'll show a plot later where the band of what the acceptable FA is has a, a, a range which is exactly representative of precisely that controversy. My point is really that just that if, if, if this were the entire story, then the amount of dark matter uh, would be specifically setting the number at the end of the day that I want uh, to be the axion decay constant, and it's not. So the second thing that you can imagine is that this peche quinn symmetry phase transition happens prior to inflation. And that's a shorthand for a lot of things, because all that means is at the end of the day, you have a massless field that either talks to GG dual or talks to some quarks. But it could just be, people like to say, it could be just like a string axion. It could be some sort of a Goldstone boson that comes to you from some UV theory that happens to have a GG dual coupling. You don't really need to explain the origin of it. The point is just that when you get down to the low energy theory, you have a field, phi, oh, sorry, you have a field A, which has this coupling. And if this was a massless field, if this is a real Goldstone boson, then it should start with some arbitrary value okay, compared to the scale f. And so in this situation, what that means then is, is that A starts with some value, right? So if you want to think of it as a peche quinn phase transition, there's some peche quinn phase transition before inflation, then the universe inflates, and then we live in a patch where A is the same value everywhere. Okay? And that means that this model is not actually terribly predictive because it could be that the patch that we live in just happened to have a very, very, very small initial value of A. Or the initial value of A could have been of order F. Or the initial value of A could have been of order a tenth of F. You don't know. 
And we'll discuss this more in, in one second. Yeah. Oh yeah, but this is, this is, uh, oh this this is a, a total derivative term, right? That's 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 why I usually say that GG dual is is not important because it's a total derivative, so uh, you don't need to worry about it, and it's only the um, non-perturbative properties that actually dictate the fact that you have CP violation. But then you can transfer that over and see that it is a derivative coupling to the axiom. Um, So, so the actual amount of energy density then that is in the axion is related to this decay constant Fa. And the actual calculation is very, very involved. Um, I have a reference that I can give you that, uh, that goes through it. Um, but the intuitive story basically works like this. The axiom potential goes like that. So the, the axiom potential goes something like lambda QCD to the fourth times cosine of A over FA. So when you expand this out, the mass of the axion is something like lambda QCD to the fourth over FA squared. Okay. So as I take higher and higher and higher values of FA, I'm taking lighter and lighter and lighter axions. So you might think from that 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 meant that lighter and lighter and lighter axions would mean less and less and less dark matter. But that's not true. Because the actual amount of energy that is in your potential is actually lambda to the fourth. right? So if you start at sort of a generic value of the, la of, of the axion field, the amount of energy density that you have in your axion potential is like, QCD to, is like lambda QCD to the fourth. So the question of how much energy density there is today in dark matter is a question of at what point this axion field goes from being stuck and slowly rolling to a point of being oscillating and thus decaying away. So if the axion is very, very light, then it takes longer for the mass to be large enough for this oscillation to begin. And if the axion is heavier, then this oscillation begins faster, and so it is diluted away more by now. So you get this counterintuitive or maybe counterintuitive result that low MA, which is to say large FA, in general means more dark matter today. Okay? So if you are in this, in either of these cases, then what you should do is you say, well, if Petit-Quinn symmetry breaking happens after inflation, then I can calculate how much energy density there is in axions. Um, and uh, then based on when this starts oscillating away, I can figure out how much dark matter there is. So I have a direct relationship between Fa and omega dark matter today. If the PQ is broken after. If the PQ is broken before, then omega dark matter today is related to both Fa and A initial. So you have to know both of these things in order to uh, have the, um, to know what the amount of dark matter there is today. And the reason that this is then tricky is that you don't know if we just happen to live in a spot in the universe where there is very, very, very little dark matter, where the initial value of the axon is very low. And people have then taken that a step further for something called the anthropic axion which is to say that if you live in the multiverse, then if you have too much dark matter, say you have orders and orders and orders of magnitude more dark matter than you have baryonic matter, then the baryonic gas is too light dilute and will not collapse and form stars and interesting things in it. So that people would argue there is an anthropic upper bound on how much dark matter there should be. So people might say, ah, look, you think that it's some very, very, very ridiculous tuning that the axion ended up, started out very, very close to the minimum of its potential, but they would say, but in different parts of the multiverse, the axion has started at different places, and we happen to be in a place where it was low, and thus structure and physicists could form. Okay? And that's the anthropic axion argument. Yeah? Uh, mm-hmm. Uh, 
Well, it's a question of how much tuning you're willing to, to accept. I mean, the same argument can be made for the, the cosmological constant. It could be noticeably bigger. So I had the opportunity to say, to say, oh, I'm just saying that to know the omega dark matter today, you need to know both the initial axion value as well as the decay constant. So, so. This is a plot. I know I'm rushing through this, but, but I want to get to anomalies as well. This is a plot that sort of summarizes a lot of the different constraints and, um, uh, that are on dark matter. And you can find this in the PDG. Okay? So on the x-axis, you have the axion mass. Or equivalently, on the x-axis, you have the axion decay constant. So very large masses over here, very small decay constants very large decay constants, very small masses. And you can take the decay constant up to essentially the Planck scale. So that top line, so pink should be read as good regions, regions where you might want to live. Other colors correspond to regions where you probably don't want to live because of constraints or, or various things. Okay? So the top pink region is saying that um, you might, so that's if you have the peche quinn phase transition happening before inflation, that means that you can actually have an, essentially an arbitrary F axion if you want to explain the dark matter. But as I move this way to higher FA, I need to have myself starting closer and closer to the origin. So you get increasingly tuned as you move this way. Okay? So over here, you would sort of be in a very, very anthropic axion region. The tuning would be so large you would probably not consider it an accident. Over here, the tuning is maybe more mild, right? Maybe a one part, maybe you start with one part in 10, one part in 100 tuning, maybe you're willing to accept that. So this region over there is sort of just a sort of a standard region of, of, um, of dark matter parameter space, um, with the only requirement being that the scale FA has to be above the inflation scale. This second line here, is uh, if the Peche-Quinn phase transition happens after inflation, the pink region is the region where you get the appropriate amount of dark matter, and the blue region is the region where you get too much dark matter. And as was pointed out uh, before, that pink region is not totally predictive. It's got some band because there is this discussion about how much axion uh, is coming from misalignment, how much of it is coming from domain walls, how much of it is coming from strings. So you have a wider region where you can explain the dark matter um, at least in principle. These blue regions are regions that are ruled out for various reasons. So there you get too much dark matter. Uh, here you have various astrophysical things uh, that usually they come from cooling. So if the axion has a coupling to photons, which in general it does, or has a coupling to electrons, as it does in the DFSZ model, uh, then these astrophysical objects have the ability to cool. And if they cool too fast, then that would be excluded based on what we see. There are some objects that maybe cool at a rate which is not exactly what they should have cooled based on our astrophysical theories. And that's where you end up with these little pink things that are called uh, HB hint, which is a hint about the cooling of a certain population of horizontal branch stars. Or uh, RG hint, which is a red giant uh, cooling hint, where things look like they're cooling at rates which are not exactly as predicted. So people have pointed to certain astrophysical coolings as saying, like, well, maybe there's some new process, and maybe that's a sign that this is an axion. These green regions correspond to future experiments, and gray corresponds to uh, existing experiments of stuff that will be tested uh, in the future. Wax? Wax doesn't mean anything. So how can there exist pink the same place as blue already do that. Is it because you're considering separate experiments? Where you can have pink where there's blue. Depends on which pink and blue you mean. The first and second. The first, well, those are different, those are different scenarios. No, 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 I'm not talking about <laughs> about uh, KSVZ. Right? Oh. It's because they're just separate experiments. So if you want to take a viable model, you would take the union of all blues. 
Sort of, but you have to be very careful. So for instance, if you look right here, right, this says RGs and GCs. So those are red giants and globular clusters. And it says GAEE DFSZ of, of situations where we weren't as smart as we thought we were. And it's, 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 if you have the ability to test a very, very, I mean, this is an incredibly weakly interacting particle, and you have the ability to actually look for it, um, it's probably worth doing. Uh, that is that is true, and there's also the relationship between the gamma gamma coupling and the the uh, nu uh, neutron neutron coupling. Um, um, well, I mean, Casper doesn't overlap even here with existing constraints. You're just in the anthropic axion region. Um, but I think the same thing is true in the, the two dimensional plot as well. But, but yeah. So let me move on from the axion, because I only have 10 minutes left. And um, I don't want to not discuss anomalies, once I can find my. Uh, uh, Mm. 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 Yep, I'm done with that. Thank you. Ah, good. So, so the last thing that I want to talk about in the last ten minutes that we have are dark matter anomalies. Now, I'm not going to talk about all of them because I think, especially about the galactic center. Tracy will have a lot to say. But I do want to talk about anomalies because anomalies have been a tremendous motivator of dark matter theory. And people have very, very different opinions about dark matter anomalies. My opinion about dark matter anomalies is that they help give you something to shoot for. That until you have something that you're trying to explain, Maybe you don't try and think about things. You're not as motivated to think about different twists and turns as you might be as if you're actually trying to explain something. And so from my perspective, dark matter anomalies have been a good thing. They've pushed us to consider a much, much broader class of models. Even if it ends up being that those anomalies are not arising from dark matter, they've really enlarged the parameter space for which we're looking for dark matter. And given that you can't find dark matter unless you know what theory it is you're looking for, it's good to have a large body of models that you can be talking about. Right? So let me just tell you about a few anomalies. Again, in the spirit of trying to make sure that if somebody says something, you know what they're talking about. And I'll mention briefly what the models are that people have talked about. Let me tell you a couple of classic anomalies. These are anomalies that have stuck around or originated a while ago and have reached some point of stasis, uh, which I'll tell you what the, whatever that is. So the first one is the integral anomaly. Um, and, and, yeah. and the integral anomaly is a, uh, an experiment that looks at um, photons in the sort of MeV-ish, KeV to MeV-ish range. And they saw an excess of 511 keV photons coming from the galactic center. This is not a new particle. This is a positron. So what they're seeing is that in the galactic center, there is a very, very large production of low energy positrons. They were seeing them at a rate of about 10 to the 43 positrons per second, which depending on who you talk to is between an order of magnitude to two orders of magnitude more than you might have guessed. But what was anomalous about the integral positrons was that they were not being produced uh, correlated with the disk. So most processes that you think should produce low energy positrons uh, would be correlated with star formation, so it would be correlated with the, the disk, whereas the integral positrons appeared to be in a sphere. And so that was the conundrum. And so there were two um, sort of basic frameworks that could explain this. 
Probably the most straightforward one of them is just to imagine that you have MeV dark matter, which was originally discussed by Bowman Fayet. And there, dark matter would just annihilate into E plus E minus. And since it's an MeV dark matter, then you get sort of very low energy positrons. You don't get high energy positrons, you get low energy positrons. And to do that, this here has to be some new dark force. Okay? So already here, you're seeing, you start with an anomaly, and you have a motivation to start considering some new particle. Another explanation for integral was a scenario called exciting dark matter. Instead of going with an MeV dark matter particle, you imagine that dark matter is like TeV and scatters. It's some pseudo Dirac state. It scatters into the excited state, and then it decays back down, emitting an E plus E minus. So you imagine that you've got a TeV mass particle with a MeV mass splitting. Okay? And again, for this to work, you need a dark photon. The status of this anomaly is I think that it's just sort of, we've reached a sort of a, a fatigue point. I don't know of any way to really definitively test whether I, any of these things are an explanation of, of, uh, of this um, um, excess. But at the same time, at least my astrophysical friends don't have very clear ideas of what would be generating this from astrophysics. But that's why it's just sort of reached this uh, point. Oh, well, this is not just, I mean, this is not the only thing this experiment does. Uh, they're making very big maps of, uh, of, the, uh, of the sky in a broad energy range. So they look at a lot of things. They're looking at, uh, uh, you know, very, yeah. They're looking at accreting systems that can be producing positrons or x-rays at, uh, at a wide range of energy. So. so so you can look for this A prime. You could definitely look for this A prime, and so you can constrain these sorts of models. But I don't know how to directly tell you whether or not this excess is coming from dark matter or not. Um, there's no smoking gun that I can look for that's going to say that's coming from dark matter. Um, are there other experiments that are doing exact same measurements? Or do they have the um, so we do not care. Do we know that these are actually real signals? I think, uh, I think that there's no reason to, to disbelieve that um, uh, that uh, that that these positrons are there. Um, so, yeah. The question is more just like what's giving them this morphology. The next classic anomaly is Pamela, or AMS. What they did is they looked at the positron fraction the positron fraction is the amount of positrons divided by electrons plus positrons. So it's how much electronic stuff out there is in the form of antimatter. And at least prior to the experiments, there was sort of a conventional wisdom that this should be some monotonically falling curve. The idea being that you have uh, astrophysical processes that accelerate objects, produce high energy uh, particles that then produce positrons through secondary interactions as they move through the, um, through the galaxy. And then, as a consequence, as you go to higher and higher and higher energies, there are fewer and fewer sources, and so you should have fewer and fewer and fewer positrons. So the idea is that you can directly accelerate electrons, because stuff is made out of them, but you don't directly accelerate positrons, you produce them secondarily. And so there should be fewer of them at high energy. And what they saw was instead that this went up, um, and this was broadly interpreted as being a primary source. So something should be making positrons, and one of those things could have been dark matter. It didn't really work with most conventional dark matter models for various uh, reasons looking for, you didn't see any antiprotons. Um, at this point, there are a lot of other things that you can look for to tell you whether this is dark matter. If you're producing positrons, you generally expect to be producing additional radiation from inverse Compton scattering, from Bremsstrahlung. Uh, you should have an effect on the CMB, as I think Nilima told you. There are a lot of things where dark matter probably should have shown up. Now, can you write down a model that would evade all of these things? Yeah, yeah, you can. You know, a fudge factor here and there, you can get a model that will explain this. But I think what I would say is that 
Dark matter has had many, many, many opportunities to demonstrate to us that it is the correct explanation of this, and up to this point, it has not availed itself of any of them. So uh, there are astrophysical explanations. Uh, people talk about pulsars, and so I think this has moved into a point of we're probably not ever going to be totally sure where this comes from, but right now the default assumption is that it's astrophysics. Sorry, yeah, this is an energy access. And this is around 10 GeV. Yeah. Oh, well, E minus just don't give you an interesting signal, right? If you produce a positron, it floats around until it finds an electron, and then it annihilates. You produce an electron, and it just floats around, and that's just what it does. So it's just it doesn't give you an interest. Likewise, if you have dark matter over here that's producing E plus and E minus, uh, this ratio here is of the order of 0.1 to 0.2. So basically, the things that are more interesting are the positrons, even though you make both of them. Um, let me discuss two more anomalies. The next anomaly, and you can give Tali a hard time about this, is Dama. Dama has uh, prompted probably more theoretical energy has been expended on trying to understand this than any other dark matter anomaly. What is it? The idea is that there is a galaxy that we live in, and it's spinning. And so even though you have a background of dark matter particles, there's some sort of dark matter wind that we're going through. But then if you look at the Earth going around the sun, so here's the Earth. As we're going around that orbit, sometimes we're moving into the wind, and sometimes we're moving out of the wind. So the flux of dark matter particles that we experience should have a seasonal modulation that should approximately peak in June. So the DAMA experiment, which was initially a 100 kilogram sodium iodide target that upgraded itself to a 250 kilogram sodium iodide target, looked for this modulation and indeed found a modulation. These are data. This is time. This is counts. And uh, at this point in the universe, everybody believes that there is a modulation at DAMA. I don't think anybody questions that the actual count rate at DAMA is going up and down in a very consistent fashion. Huh? What they're counting is, what, so, so sodium iodide is a scintillating crystal. So what happens is, in principle, is that dark matter is supposed to come in, smack a nucleus, it then produces scintillation light, you've got PMTs at the end of it, and then you read out that. So you're looking at uh, uh, scintillation light counts. Um, this is the modulation. So this is around one, this is a one to two percent modulation over a much larger background. Okay? So people have expended, had a lot of different ideas um, on this. At this point, and I will say this from a, a perspective, is I do not know, and this is not to say there is not one, I do not know of a model that can currently explain the DAMA result consistent with all other null experiments. That is true for both dark matter models as well as conventional models. So that is to say conventional models like, oh, they're actually seeing muons in cosmic rays or something like that. And there is a very, very simple reason why this is a very hard uh, anomaly to explain. And that is because if you look at the unmodulated count rate, they have some cutoff here at 2 keV. Um, you can understand most, if not all, of the unmodulated rate coming from various radioactive products in the experiment in the surrounding region. So by looking up at very, very high energies, you can get measurements of what kinds of radioactive sources you have, extrapolate those to low energies, and you can explain at least, let's say, about 90% of the unmodulated rate. Maybe 100% of it, but at least 90% of it. So what that means, then, is that if, if you, as long as you say that this background radioactivity is not modulating, then what you're trying to explain is this stuff modulating. 
right? So if dark matter is producing stuff, it's not producing a lot of that signal. It's producing a little bit of that signal. And that means that dark matter is not modulating in the summer versus winter at 1 to 2%. It's modulating at a level of 10 to 20%, OK? Because most of this stuff is just sitting there. You've only got a little bit of stuff that's unexplained. And if that stuff is what's modulating, then this tiny little modulation is actually a very big modulation. And the reason it's such a hard scenario to explain is it's very hard to come up with something that modulates 10 to 20% annually, okay? whether that's dark matter or not dark matter. There are dark matter models that do it, but at this point, all the ones that I know are excluded. It could, be, it could be wrong, but this is, I mean, this is coming both from the Dhamma people as well as independent people who've looked at the experiment. And you look at the high energy, and you just can say, well, how much? You can, you can try and understand the, the, like the, the lines and the things that they see and say, this is what I, what, what's explaining that high energy radiation, the part that's not modulating. It's only this low energy part that's modulating. So um, I think even if you talk to the Dom people, they'll tell you, yes, there's only a, a small fraction of it which is unexplained. Why do they give you a large modulation? So to get a large modulation, if you want it to be dark matter, usually you have to take advantage of some uh, kinematical fine tuning of some type. So that is to say, like, uh, there are models where there's an excitation, so dark matter upscatters, or you have a very light dark matter particle that only can scatter a little bit. And if that's true, then it's only, if you think about your maximal Boltzmann distribution, it's only the very, very high velocity particles that can actually interact with your experiment. And so if that's true, then when you're modulating, you're modulating around on the tail of an exponential. And that's where you get your large modulation from. And that's not what makes them ruled out. It's ruled out the fact that you know, Xenon should have seen them, or CDMS should have seen them, or Lux should have seen them, or so on and so forth. Right? That at this point, I don't know a model that shouldn't have shown up in some other experiment. Well, it, yeah, so, so that depends on which model you're talking about and which part of the phase space that you're talking about. If you're talking about the very, very, very highest velocity particles, then that is less relevant. If you're talking about more uh, conventional model particles, then that, is very, that can be very, very relevant. Yeah. So let me say one last anomaly, and then I'm going to stop. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, inelastic dark matter was proposed to explain Dhamma. Yeah, I think it's excluded. Look, hey, I'm going to be the first person who would love inelastic dark matter not to be excluded. But So the thing is that right now you have this experiment, which is KU, uh, which is an experiment uh, that's done by um, Juan Collar and collaborators, which has a, um, a CF3i uh, in it. So it has iodine in it. And what they can actually do is they can look at just their total count rate. And their total count rate is less than the DAMA modulation rate. So if you're talking about inelastic dark matter scattering off of iodine, Q at this point is just a really, really tough nut to crack. If you have an idea, I would love to hear it. Well, not if, I mean, if, if you're talking about the iodine explanation, then it's just one experiment is iodine, the other experiment is iodine, and then you can compare them directly. Um, if you're talking about sodium, then you're generally talking about lighter particles, and, uh, and the other experiments are already more sensitive to them. So, but we can, we, can, we can talk. Maybe you can convince me. I'm happy to be convinced. But it's, it's, I think it's, it's tough. Yeah. At this point, there have not been any experiments with sodium iodide that are as sensitive as DAMA. DAMA perfected a technique. Tally will tell you all this. DAMA perfected a technique of getting very, very low backgrounds. It's taken a long time for people to develop similarly effective techniques of low background sodium iodide. And they owned patents on the process and would not allow other people to do the, build the sodium iodide. So, but now there's going to be a series of experiments that will, will do this. Aren't there also some claims that the size of the modulation in DAMA has been increasing over time? 
Yeah, um, if you look at the 100 kilogram run versus the 250 kilogram run, there seems to be a lower modulation rate in the 250. I don't know if you would claim that statistically that significant. Um, it could be some sort of, it, it could be a, something like a discovery bias thing, um, where the only reason you paid attention to it in the first one was because you happened to get a little bit bigger than it, it, it should have been. Um, yeah. It, even so, the modulation is there and it's very, very hard to understand. That could be telling you about something that your, you know, particle is being screened by the outer part of the detector or something like that, right? Like, you know, who knows? Like none of the backgrounds have any modulation whatsoever? No, backgrounds have modulation. So, for instance, your background coming from cosmic ray, um, cosmic ray produced, say, muons and things like that will be modulating because the, si the, the height of the atmosphere modulates in summer and winter. And so the path length for pions um, to decay uh, is, is longer in... Uh, in summer and winter, um, and so you get more or fewer things depending on whether they smack into the ground or not before they decay. Um, but those things show up in other ways. Again, these things are usually few percent modulation. Every, yeah, every one of these things that you can kind of talk about, if you actually look at it in detail, it's very, very hard to explain what you're seeing. All right, let me say one last anomaly, because at least there's one that is currently undergoing discussion. Um, so, there are recent claims of an excess in uh, X-rays at 3.5 keV. So, this was seen in clusters, in the Perseus cluster in particular, uh, in Andromeda, and in the Milky Way. Now, none of these claims of discovery smack you in the face. And uh, the, the clusters in Perseus, I think, independently, those look reasonably convincing. But you probably would not have been convinced, at least I wouldn't have been, by the Milky Way one if I hadn't already been looking for it. So I'm not sure what to make of that. But I'm just telling you, these are the claims that people have made, that they see an excess at 3.5 keV, a line that cannot be explained by an atomic transition um, in these systems. There have been arguments about whether or not you can explain this with, say, an excess of potassium or chlorine. I'm not going to get into those. I'm happy to talk about them after. Um, I have not been personally engaged in those arguments, but those arguments have been going on. But the canonical explanation for this is that you have some sterile neutrino, which is at 7 keV, and it's decaying radiatively into a light neutrino and a photon. And to be of credit to uh, all the sterile neutrino people, including um, Scott, who wrote down the original dodelson widrow mechanism for production of sterile neutrinos, uh, this mass range is sort of in their wheelhouse, right? They said, the, the sterile neutrino people said, hey, you should go out and you should be looking for x-rays in this energy range because they could be coming from uh, relic sterile neutrinos decaying. Now, if you actually look at most models of sterile neutrinos, it's a little bit off in terms of the parameter space, in terms of cross-section, in terms of decay rates and mass and things like that. Um, but, you know, not that far off, like maybe a couple orders of magnitude off, which when you've got a lot of things to play with is not so bad, right? Um, and, you know, within, you know, the models, you can really, there, there can be a lot of variation. So that, I think, was, is, a, is a very interesting explanation of it. However, people have looked at um, dwarf galaxies and uh, stacked, and looked at the outer parts of stacked galaxies. So you take a stack of regular galaxies, and you stack them, and you look at the outer parts of the galaxies where there's not supposed to be any X-ray emission. And these have both been null results. And this one in particular uh, claims to exclude that kind of interpretation by about 11 sigma. And you can kind of see the line, and it's pretty, I, I think it's pretty tough to explain. So why I want to bring this up is, and it, it, I'll admit this is, a, this is a, a pet favorite of mine in terms of models, but I think that it also makes a nice little pedagogical point, which is that one possible explanation for this is that dark matter is upscattering to some excited state, and then that excited state is decaying back down and emitting a photon. And the reason why this can explain the positive and negative results is that 
Those things tend to be high velocity environments. The null results tend to be from low velocity environments. This sort of a signal is usually concentrated in the centers of clusters and galaxies. And the limits are, well, at least the stack galaxies in the outer parts. So there's a natural way that you can do this. And this scattering can be coming from either dark matter or from ordinary matter, depending on what that mediator is. Um, and the reason why I want to bring this up is that it's kind of interesting because this model is really just repurposing the model for integral. But you know, you tweak some stuff, and you, you, you do things, and you move things around. And so I think this is an instructive example where you know, maybe integral is wrong, or not wrong. Maybe it's not dark matter. But you start thinking about these anomalies, and you start broadening your toolkit of thinking about what dark matter can be. And then when new things come along, sometimes it's maybe that's what you're actually supposed to be understanding. Maybe the galactic center is coming from dark matter, and uh, it's those models uh, uh, that, that explain it. So, so that's all I want to say about that. So before I conclude, because I'm, I'm way over time, but before I conclude, I just want to say one thing uh, to you guys, which is I've actually really, really enjoyed uh, being here and talking to you guys. Uh, I think that if you go out into the world, the physics world, you probably encounter a lot of people who are very happy to explain to you how much they know about stuff. Uh, and so that's usually unfortunate because it's not the stuff that you know where you make progress. It's the stuff that you don't know where you make progress. And at least for me, most of my best ideas have always come out of a point of some degree of either severe or moderate confusion. So uh, being in a place where I haven't seen any of that posturing of, from anybody of like trying to like, you know, just people who are really enthusiastic about learning and understanding, it's been incredibly refreshing. Uh, and so I want to thank you for letting me share in that, even for a little brief time. So I uh, hope the rest of your summer goes great. And thanks for your attention.